Hey everyone, it's Lisa with Are You My Cousin? And I am popping into Facebook and YouTube tonight, the eve of Roots Tech, um, because I just thought it might be fun to get together with my friend, Melissa Barker, the archive lady. Hey, Melissa. Hello, Lisa. Glad to be here. Oh, glad to have you. We thought it would be fun to get together and chat about things you find in the archives that you might overlook. Um, and also just kind of a fun way to kind of just get ready, get ourselves excited <laughs> for Roots Tech. I mean, of course, we're excited for Roots Tech, but to kind of get ourselves in the mode for it and everything like that. So um, that's what we are here today, tonight to talk about. Again, it's very, it's very informal, much like what I usually do on a Thursday afternoon. Um, if you have questions for um, Melissa or myself, feel free to leave them in the comment section. I will be monitoring those as we go and we'll be glad to... Um, get some questions answered for you. Um, a couple of things, as you know, guys, and I doubt you've, uh, you can't, you can't really miss it unless, <laughs> unless you're not on social media these days, but Roots Tech does start tomorrow. It's tomorrow, Friday and Saturday. If you have not registered, you can still register guys. There are over, over 600,000 people have registered. Most, I don't, you might have a more updated number than I do, but. Um, the, the number is changing <laughs> by the exactly. minute that um, you could look at the number and in five minutes it's changed. So yeah, uh, 600,000, I think it's over that by now, but yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I know. After that, I was like, okay, because I kept wanting to post about the number and I was like, okay, <laughs> I can't keep up. We'll just, we'll just say over 600,000. So, so that, I mean, that's, that's a tremendous number of people. It shows to the popularity of Roots Tech. It is an international crowd, which I think is a really unique way, um, just a, a unique conference to be able to reach and talk with people literally around the world um, with this. So anyway, we've got Melissa here. Melissa, if you guys have not met Melissa Barker, and she and I have been friends for, I don't know, kind of a long time now. We <laughs> have. Um, and she is known as the Archive Lady. She has a website called A Genealogist in the Archives because Melissa is not only a genealogy researcher, Melissa is an archivist. And that means she knows how to take care of all those documents and preserve those documents and all that, not just documents, um, just all the, the historical things that are, you, know, you would find in archives. Melissa knows what to do with that stuff. Um, and you are the, you have, is it the Houston or Houston? How do you say it? Houston County? Houston County Archives and Museum now. We just recently received the designation of museum. So now we are the Houston County Archives and Museum. Oh, congratulations. Congratulations. Yes. Guys, that's in Tennessee. I don't know. About yes, it's in Tennessee. Tennessee. <laughs> yes, it's uh, um, about an hour and a half due west of Nashville. Uh, so kind of one of those places you drive through to get to somewhere else. But we were formed in 1871, so we have a very rich history, like all communities where our ancestors lived. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're right, and uh, you know a lot of that. I know for those of us like myself who research um, North Carolina ancestry or Virginia ancestry, we'll see a lot of our ancestors heading out in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, definitely. So, hey, Deb's in, in the chat, and Linda's in the chat as well, guys. I'm going to go ahead and put um, Melissa's link to her blog in the chat there so you can find it. And just one quick announcement, guys. Um, as I said, if if you're watching this on replay, Roots Tech will have probably come and gone. But <laughs> for those of you who are watching it live, Roots Tech starts tomorrow. I would love to be able to connect with you throughout those three days on Roots Tech. And you can do that. I will put my link to, I created um, my little schedule of what I'm doing live and when and where uh, at Roots Tech. So and actually some of it's just gonna be live on my website as well. So I will have that link in the comment section and description below as well. So you guys can get to that as well. So Melissa is here to chat with us again, like I said, about those things that we as researchers could potentially find in the archives, but that we often overlook or don't, don't think about. It's kind of hard to search for something when you don't know what you're when you don't know they even search for it, right, Melissa? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I would love for you to be able to help us expand our our thought processes into that, and 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 our our creativity, I guess, almost I want to say when it comes to research that we're creative about what types of records we're looking for. Um, so I'm going to ask you, what is your favorite? What start with your favorite set of records you think people really need to know about that they're that they're missing? 
Well, well, before I answer that, first of all, I must say that, you know, um, I'm known for this statement. So everything is not online. Uh, <laughs> there's actually no, probably right. somewhere between one and three percent of all of the world's genealogical records and historical records are actually online. The remaining percentage, which is 95 to 98 percent of our genealogical and historical records are sitting in archives. Um, and so I know there's a tremendous amount of records coming online every day, and that's fantastic. Archives are really trying to get as much as they can digitized and online, but you still need to contact those archives. Now, many people tell me, I can't travel. I don't travel. I can't get to the places where my ancestors live. No problem. I've been researching my Ohio, West Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania ancestors right here from Tennessee for the past 32 years. Now, there are some things I'm going to have to go there and see, but for the most part, I've been able to get the documents and things that I want. So what's my favorite collection in an archive? I would have to say my favorite collection is a manuscript collection. Ooh. I get asked all the time, what is a manuscript collection? And I could give you the archivist um, definition, but I'm going to tell you this way. Think about all of the genealogical records you have in your possession. You have census records, you have photographs, you have grandma's quilt, you've got the family Bible, you have a lock of hair, or you have anything and everything having to do with your family history. Take all of those things, put them in some boxes, carry them out to your car, drive down to the local archive, and donate them. That is a manuscript collection. So that tells you that there literally could be anything in a manuscript collection. There could be scrapbooks. There could be diaries. But majority of what's in a manuscript collection, you're not going to find online or microfilmed anywhere. It's going to be sitting in boxes in archives. So what can you find in manuscript collections? You find original records. These are records that were produced, um, collected by our ancestors, their neighbors, uh, and they ended up at an archive. So you think about a diary that's handwritten, first account information that you're not going to find anywhere else. A scrapbook is so individual because individuals put them together. Not one is, a, is the same as the other. And so those are some of my favorite things I like to find in a manuscript collection. So what you need to look for when you look for go to an archive or you contact an archive, you need to ask them for their index of their finding aids. Finding aids are a document that the archivist produces while they are processing a manuscript collection. Now, this has a lot of information in it, a lot of great information, but the part you want to hone in on is the contents listing. The contents listing is the folder by folder, box by box listing of what is in the collection. So it's going to say something like box one, folder one, correspondence from 1925 to 1935. Okay. So you know that there's correspondence in that particular file. Uh, some archives are more detailed with their finding aids, some are not. And so it's just important you look at those finding aids. Uh, it will list if it has scrapbooks, if it has diaries, whatever it may have in it. Uh, so manuscript collections, I think, are some one of the most underused records collections by genealogists. Do you think part of it is the name? If when they're called manuscript collections, I confess, until I knew what a manuscript collection was when I was, I thought it was documents. Or you know, I, I, I did. It didn't occur to me that it could be things like the scrapbook and thing. I, I thought it was literal, like longhand pages and pages of documents. I don't know what I thought, guys. I was a new genealogist, but I wonder if that sort of, I wonder if that's, you know, kind of a misconception that, that researchers get early on that that's what would be considered in the box, you know? Absolutely. I think sometimes they think it's some author's manuscript that, you know, before they actually publish their book or something. Um, so that's why um, I even have a pre whole presentation on manuscript collections that I get to societies. Um, if you are part of a society looking for a speaker, contact me, get Call my it. email address, you know, but yes, um, and so that's why for the past, since 2015, I have been teaching and I guess preaching <laughs> about manuscript collections because I was a genealogist since 1990. I became an archivist in 2010. So I kind of got to swap. I was a genealogist working in archives and then I was working in archives, working with genealogists. And I started realizing that genealogists were not asking me about our manuscript collections. 
And so then it dawned on me, you know, um, I need to get the word out there about these collections and how valuable they are. You can find original records in them. You can find records, like I said, that you can't find in any other records or online databases. Uh, it may even include information to help you tear down that brick wall you've had for years. Yeah, I actually found um, one time merchant records. Mm -hmm. So and there are these little, literally scripts, of, scraps of paper that were, you know, said I owe you, I forget, you know, like a penny <laughs> and it was for a spool of thread for, for and a woman had signed it. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't sound like much, but if you are researching in a burned county, yeah. that, that document or, or that merchant book literally was listing out the, you know, a, a huge part of the community that shopped there and it put them in place and time and when the county records had been destroyed. So yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, manuscript collections not only include personal records from people, but they include business records. They mm -hmm. include church records, school records, uh, any kind of entity, a civil organization, uh, like a civil group or um, uh, a civic group, that, like the Garden Club or uh, the Junior Civitan, you know, any of these kinds of clubs could mm -hmm. have donated their records, old records. And so you could find your ancestor in records like that. Now, don't also don't forget your ancestors and neighbors. You may not have known who your their neighbors were, but if you find a manuscript collection at an archive where your ancestors lived and it contains a scrapbook, I would look at that scrapbook because maybe that neighbor or someone who lived in the community clipped out a newspaper clipping that included your ancestor and pasted it into their scrapbook. Absolutely. I actually have my grandmother's scrapbook. I think mm -hmm. she started it. Um, oh gosh. I don't remember somewhere in the early 1930s. And I mean, it literally, she did, she did exactly that. And so if anybody in Surrey County, you know, the Salem Fork area of Sur Surrey County, you know, is looking for ancestors, you know, they might be, they're probably in this scrapbook that we have because she cut out, you know, she was related to most of them, but she cut out things and her friends and, you know, gum wrappers and things like that too, which is just a lot of fun to do. Oh, I got to see her and with her old boyfriend too, her, like her first boyfriend, which is hysterical because it was not my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> well, another, another collection of records I would encourage people to look into are school records. Um, mm -hmm. And I would encourage you to look for school records, even if you know that your ancestor didn't attend school and maybe if they went to school just for a few years. And the reason I say that, and I'll tell you, I came to the school records aspect of researching uh, kind of late. Um, I just kind of saw them as, well, if my ancestor didn't go to school, then I don't need to look at the school records. Or I, we don't care to know my ancestor's grades. I thought that was all that was in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I was working in an archives. I found a piece of paper, just like you talked about, a little slip of paper. We had had the the school board donated all of their really old records to us dating back to 1895, their school board minute books. And then these boxes and boxes and boxes of it looked like someone had just cleaned out filing cabinets from the mm -hmm. 1920s up to the 1970s. And they included mm -hmm. these little slips of paper that were like receipts or invoices. And I found one from my husband's grandfather. I actually live in the area where my husband's family's from. And his grandfather, who I knew, he died in 2000. And it was a receipt where he got paid in 1940 to, uh, he was a carpenter. So he built the cabinets that went into the home economic uh, class at mm -hmm. the Stewart School where um, they lived. And my mother-in-law, his daughter, went to school. Uh, I can tell you that he never went to school a day in his life. But yet this piece of paper, this document was in the school board records. Um, I, when I told my mother-in-law about this piece of paper, it was before it happened before she was born. She went to that school. She never realized that her father had built the cabinets in the home economic class. Wow. That's amazing. So that is amazing. That's that the kind amazing. of finds that you find in manuscript collections or in any kind of a collection in archive that doesn't have their records online. Uh, mm -hmm. Things like that. You can find original records. You're not going to find just copies or digitized copies. You're going to find original records. Now you're going to have to talk to the archivist, talk to the mm -hmm. librarian, talk to the historical or genealogical society members who are operating uh, their facility. Because you're going to have to talk to them about what kind of records do you have? 
Do you have manuscript collections? Um, what do you have an index to your finding aids? Indexes, indexes. You need to look at the indexes because um, archivists may not have the equipment or the ability or the time to digitize everything, but they do try to get those indexes done. Yeah, and I think that's that's so important that that we need to make sure you know, when you're ready to hit when you're ready to really delve into those kinds of records would be to reach out to that archivist because. Mm -hmm. My experience has been, and Melissa, you could probably speak to this, is that they're not always done the same way. You know, one one archives might do it a little different than do it different. And, and depending on what time period you're looking at, even within the same archives, you know, somebody in the 1920s may have created it and done it one way, but then processes evolved. And, you know, later on, things are get done a little different. So, I don't know. You're, you're right. There, you there is the straight and ask and say, mm -hmm. you know, where are your finding aids and how do I use them to, you know, here's what I'm looking for. How should I, how do I best search them? I'll give you a couple examples of that. There is um, a standard of how to archive manuscript collections. Uh, and so there's a standard that we're taught as archivists. However, mm -hmm. just like you said, uh, archivists and archives do things maybe slightly differently. And the two examples I'll give you is this. I mentioned scrapbooks. Um, scrapbooks normally are kept with the particular collection they were donated with uh, and they were and they're archived accordingly. Well, I have known um, some archivists that have taken all of the scrapbooks that they have in their archives from whatever collection they came in with and put those scrapbooks into one collection, and put them all together. Oh. I have seen them do that. And they have also done that with photographs. I have seen oh. archivists take all of the photographs that they have and put them in one place. Um, and so I have seen that. And Ooh, so the there's, the, it's the risk of losing. <laughs> you hope that they've documented it well. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the standard, if you were to take something like that out of a particular collection to put it in another collection, you would mm -hmm. document in the finding aid that you've taken it out and then where it is located. You have to cover your tracks so, so you can see the timeline of where whatever it is went. Yeah. Okay. That makes, that makes a good, good point mm -hmm. there. Hey, we've got a couple questions coming through the comments. Sure. So let me get back to Catherine's. She asked a, a, a little while back. She's at, she says she's looking for a deposition about an adoption in Williamson County, Tennessee, mm -hmm. probably around 1842, but the dep deposition was probably given about 1861. So the, okay. I guess the adoption was occurring around 1842. Deposition okay. sounds like it was about 1861. Do you have any suggestions where to start looking for something like that? Uh, first thing I will say, in the state of Tennessee, adoption records are closed. Um, they are, unfortunately, they are closed. Uh, as an archivist in Tennessee, we are instructed to take any adoption records that we have in our archives and put them aside and mark them that, that no one can see them unless there's a court order. Now, mm -hmm. I will but with that, I will say this. She's talking about the 1800s. Right. Many times these, this information is located in court minute books. Okay. This is not okay. something that is easily redacted or taken out and then put it aside with adoption records. And so I would suggest that she get, reaches out to the Williamson County Archives, which they have a fantastic archive. There's the Williamson County Archives and Museum in Franklin, Tennessee. Ooh. Uh, and talk to them there about looking for this in their court records. That's a good. And suggest. they'll be in the minute books, most likely. Okay, that's a good idea. And Tammy has a question, too, from Facebook. She said, when you talk of archives, she thinks of libraries and genealogy historical societies. But do you have other suggestions? Absolutely. This is how I tell genealogists uh, what an archives is. Any place that has records, whether they're being preserved or not, is an archive. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, we all live, if we're genealogists and we have records, we have an archive. And so, yes, um, one of the, some of the places that genealogists don't think about, they think about an archive. Now there are different kinds of archives. There are county archives, there are city archives, there are state archives, and there are national archives. But then you look at libraries could have archives, mm -hmm. genealogical and historical societies. If they have a building with records, they have archives. Then you move into the places that genealogists don't think about, university and college libraries and archives on their campuses. Yes, we can access those even though we're not going to college there. And some of our campuses, these college campuses, have more than one archive or library. 
Mm -hmm. And then there's museums. Museums are a type of archive. Now, museums are maybe a little more difficult to actually do research in. Uh, museum curators um, are actually kind of worse than archivists about being protective of their <laughs> records. <laughs> but you think about you go into a museum and you see a Civil War letter on display or a photograph on display you know what, they have more of that stuff in the back room sitting in boxes. And so we need to look at our museums. One of the things I teach genealogists is that when you're researching in a particular area, whether you're new to that area and researching or you've been researching there for a long time, reach out to these organizations. Also mm -hmm. talk to the Chamber of Commerce. I've also been known to try to find out who the oldest person in the community who's lived there their whole lives is and ask this question, where are the records? Because if you contact offices in the courthouse that are doing today's business and you ask the clerk, hey, where's the old records? Well, I mean, she may have only been working there for a year and she's like, well, I don't know. They've probably been thrown away or I don't know where they're at. You know, they're doing today's business. Now, there are some great clerks that know a lot of information about where those records are. Mm -hmm. But you need to get a hold of people that have lived there for a very long time. The historical society, genealogical societies, they know where the records are, whether they're in a barn somewhere or they're being organized and in an archive. Absolutely. I know um, the town historian can be mm -hmm. such a, uh, some small towns. I never thought to look, I knew about the historical societies, of course, but I had never really thought to reach out to a town historian that had been appointed. Yes. And um, I had that experience where I was, um, having trouble finding information on a family grave. It was like in the middle of a cornfield kind of thing. And I was trying to find out more information about that. And um, fortunately the town was not that far. It's on the other side of the county where I live. I, so I just drove, I just drove over there. And I drove to the courthouse cause I couldn't, I wasn't getting a good response when I would email. I mean, they were, they were like, okay, we'll follow up. But they were doing today's business. They weren't worried about this, right? you know, thing, this old, cemetery that was you know no mm -hmm. longer active for years and um so i i went up to the the clerk or the um the check-in desk and turned out the receptionist bless her heart <laughs> i'm obviously from the south bless her heart she turned out to be the town historian and let me tell you she went to bat for me that's fantastic yeah <laughs> she's like i know who you need to talk to i even know where that stuff is but i have to go through her she said i will call you when she gets out of her meeting and um, yeah, so yeah so finding that person in the know and again it comes to getting out the computer i think a lot of times and, and, you know and you've got to push away from that computer as much as i love to do research online yeah. um i can tell you that you know and, and we've been through a couple of years now where we haven't been able to do anything and you may still not be able to travel that's okay use the telephone use mm -hmm. email our archives used to be kind of archaic when it came to replying to emails and telephone calls they're doing much better now because they know that their patrons need them to be accessible that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and you talked about uh, historians. Um, in the state of Tennessee, by law, each county is required to have a county historian. I did not know that. Yes. And so you look at, if you're researching in Tennessee, you look at whatever county you're researching in, you find out who that county historian is. That is good to know. That is good to know. Wonderful. So let me ask you, how? what is the difference between something landing in the manuscript collections mm -hmm. versus landing in a vertical file collection? Okay, well, let's talk about vertical files. If you've not done research in vertical files, you should be. Mm -hmm. um, and some archives are called vertical files. Sometimes they're called subject files. And then I've also seen them called morgue files. Uh, morgue files, um, I've seen them more used whenever the vertical file collection is all obituaries. Uh, so yeah. they've called them morgue files. Uh, a vertical file is, I, I kind of like to say they're like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Uh, because vertical files contain uh, anything and everything. They um, should have an index for you to look at. And in, in that index, these vertical files are organized in file folders, in filing cabinets. And then they'll be indexed by either surname or subject name. So you can look for your surname, but if you're also doing research on a school or a church or a business in the area, they may have a vertical file uh, for that particular thing. Now, what's the difference between a vertical file and a manuscript collection? Uh, vertical files are smaller. Uh, they could be have one piece of paper in them. They could have five pieces of paper in them. But sometimes what happens if there, there's enough that gets into a particular vertical file for a particular surname or subject name, the archivist will take that and turn it into a manuscript collection. Okay. I have seen that as well. 
Uh, and so vertical files, like I said, I have seen uh, photographs. I've seen original vital records in them. I've mm -hmm. seen family group sheets. I encourage genealogists to donate your family group sheets to archives for them to put in your the vertical files. Why yeah. should we do that? Because if you put your contact information on there, there may be a genealogist who comes along behind you, finds that family group sheet and can contact you. You make a connection and you've got um, some descendants and some people that you connect with. I've, I've absolutely done that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I will look at that, those old genealogist notes and I will, you know, if, see if they're still around or if they're descendants or, you know, oftentimes, you, you know, maybe the research is just written down and maybe it's not sourced. And of course I wouldn't want to find out, but, you know, when I find even just a handwritten tree or handwritten notes and they give a very specific birth date or death date, they may not source it, but typically if there's a very specific date, they got it from somewhere. You know, and but so it gives I'll, you something to go them. on. It gives it, you something right. to go it gives on. You something to go especially on, especially if you have nothing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can have something to go on. So yeah, vertical files, management collections, photograph collections. Many of our archives have whole photograph collections. Are mm -hmm. you looking for your ancestors' photograph? Um, look for those photograph collections. Also, if you have a photo of your ancestor. When you're working with an archive, ask them about their unidentified photograph file. Mm. All archives have them and they have a lot of photographs in them. And if you have photographs of your ancestors that you can compare with their unidentified, you can identify some for them and they would be very happy for you to do that. Well, wow. yeah. So I can tell you if for those of you who are have North Carolina ancestors. So North Carolina Archives has actually a um, Flickr account where they and they have like photo ph photographer studios um did they the photos that were left in a you know mm -hmm. left over in, an, in a photographer studio and that they don't know who they are and they have collections of those on Flickr for people to see to try to figure out who they are um so that's a great the absolute it's a great way to do um, absolutely do yeah and I've seen um, that with other archives checking them on Flickr North Carolina just does a really good job of getting things digitized I've found um but yeah, checking checking what's around there and see and check who those photographers mm -hmm. were. And I have a archive or a genealogist ask me all the time, how do I know what what's it what the archives has? Uh, you know, without having to go there. Well, many of our archives have fantastic websites. Uh, now, when you go to the website, I'm warning you now, I don't know what it is about archivists, but we make it very difficult to find anything on a website. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but that's just something that we do. And so you're going to have to click and dig and look, because believe me, under layers and layers of clicking, you're probably going to find indexes. You're going to find finding aids, and you may even find digitized records, but you may have to dig for it. Also look for their social media accounts. You mentioned Flickr. Mm -hmm. uh, many archives will share things on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Uh, all of the social media accounts, they do that because that's part of their outreach to reach those that are needing to do research. Mm -hmm. uh, and many of these places, archives have actually uh, developed or uh, put out there some social media accounts during uh, the last couple of years because they wanted to keep in contact with their patrons. Uh, and so we as genealogists need to use these facilities. And I'll tell you why, and this is very basic, but all of these facilities have funding and budgets. Mm -hmm. And if they are not used and they take statistics, they write down who, how many people's called, how many people's emailed, how many people's walked in the door, um, who's used this collection, who's used that collection. Uh, they keep those statistics to show the people who are holding the purse strings that our facility is being used. It's vital to the community, especially the genealogy community at large, and they will continue to receive funding. If we just mm -hmm. stay online and stop using all of these archives, uh, then they may get their budgets cut. And I have seen some archives the last couple of years have actually had to close their doors. Yeah. Uh, not genealogist's fault, but just the situation. And mm -hmm. so, email them, call them, reach out to them on uh, social media, on their, on their uh, websites. If they have an ask an archivist button or ask a librarian button, click on it, use it. Uh, we have all these tools at our disposal and we should be using all of them. Yeah. I, I've used that. Um, I think I, I probably personally have done it more with the university collections, mm -hmm. the, you know, because they all have very prominent, you know, ask me a question kind of thing. And they are staffed um, for that purpose. And um, yeah, that's gotten really good um, resources that way. Uh, 
really good answers and direction. And, and I think that's part of it is, is, it's not only is it what we get from it, but it's building that relationship with that particular archives, because most of us probably know if I came to Melissa's um, archives and museum and I was researching um, Houston County ancestors, then, you know, and I might find things and leave, but then I'm, you know, probably, I probably didn't find everything <laughs> that she might have had. So, but it's that kind of thing. And she might, you know, she knows what I'm looking for. Or she, you know, she'll, mm -hmm. she can point me to things. I know um, definitely when I've researched in Halifax County, Virginia, there was a gentleman who worked at the courthouse who his job was to help researchers. That's Unique right. situation, but yes. yeah. Um, I, I think we're probably related somewhere down the line. But anyway, <laughs> me and my dad turned out they knew each other from like, years and years and years and years ago but anyway um but you know he would be able he could tell me things to look for that I never even I didn't know to look for those I didn't know the records existed and he said this is you know or there's a, this quirk this is oh, this is where I was going with this sorry guys um there's you know there's a quirk in the records in other words you know for whatever reason for for this time period um you know the justice of the peace didn't do a good job of following the returns or so you'll see that um but folks who are, are on the ground, they know that, whereas we can't possibly know things like that. Um, True. Yeah. And one of the things that I encourage genealogists to do, if you're going to visit an archive, any kind of archive, contact them ahead of time by email or call them and tell them that you're coming when you're coming. First of all, make sure they're going to be open, maybe having painting yeah. that day and they don't have it posted anywhere. So make sure they're going to be open. But ask for a tour of their facility. Oh, that's a great um, I always get tours of facilities. About two, three years ago, I actually toured the National Archives in Fort Worth. I called ahead. I made a date and plan, and I was able to tour the facility. One of the things that you need to pay attention to when you're touring a facility and you're talking about records you don't know about, when they're taking you to those back, what they call stacks, the archivists call them stacks, uh, these shelves full of documents, pay attention to the labels on those boxes. Because you may see something that you don't realize that they have, a type of record or a manuscript collection that's of interest to you. Uh, maybe they have map cabinets that are full of maps, uh, and, you know, things like that. So pay attention. I, um, about several years ago, when we first started the archives here, I toured, I was touring some of the other local archives because I was the one who helped to start our archives uh, in 2010. And so I was traveling and looking at other archives. And so I asked for tours. And one of the counties near us, I took a tour. And I know the lady now really well. But as I was taking that tour, they had this huge table. And the table was covered with old letters. And I asked her, I said, what is going on here? And they said, well, we have just received a donation of over 200 Civil War letters that we're processing. And I got to see that. Wow. And I got to ask questions. Well, what are the surnames? And so that's how you kind of get to know. And you also develop a relationship with the archivist. When you're going to be doing research in a particular area, a county, a city, and you know that a lot of your family was there for a lot of years, you need to develop that relationship because you're going to, like you said, be going back, going back, calling, emailing, because mm -hmm. you're going to keep needing things. Yeah. Definitely. So Carol has a question um, in, in the on the YouTube channel, and she says, how do you locate the county historians? She's um, Macon or Jackson County. In Macon or Jackson County? Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember. It's online. I think it's on the Secretary of State's website. I tell you what, if you drop me an email, um, I'll be glad to see if I can't find who that is for you. Okay. What's your oh, What's your email? I'll put it in there. It's uh, my name, Melissa Barker, 20 mm -hmm. at hotmail.com. Okay. Oh, I can do that. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Well, I type that in there. Um, would you speak to this tip that you gave me years ago about asking about is it unprocessed or un? <laughs> well, I can't unprocessed it. records. This yes. is, this one gets me in trouble with archivists. You know, oh, this is where really? it does because this is where my genealogist into archives aspect comes in. Um, all archives, you know, we talked about manuscript collections and I told you how to take your own records, put them in boxes, take them. Okay. That is an unprocessed manuscript collection because when we get a hold of them, we flatten everything with documents. We take the metal out of everything. Uh, we, we catalog it. We put it in file folders and make it nice and neat. If you've ever done research at an archive so that it's ready for researchers. Well, there are lots of collections that are sitting on shelves that are not processed that have been donated that are not necessarily available to researchers. 
I call those unprocessed records. Well, your ancestors' information may be sitting in one of those boxes. And all archivists, if they've done what they're supposed to, they usually do a cursory inventory of what they're receiving. Because first of all, they have to look at what's being trying to be donated to decide if they even want the donation. Because mm -hmm. many archives are very specific about what they want. So they have this cursory inventory. They should know a little bit about what is in that collection. Uh, and so then, as you as a genealogist, you should ask the question, do you have any unprocessed collections? Uh, and the archivists are probably get you like, well, what are you talking about? Because they don't want everybody to know that they have these collections. Uh, and the larger the archives, the more of these that they have sitting on the shelves, because it takes manpower and time to process these. And so they get to them as fast as they can. And I understand that. But there are some archives that will allow genealogists and researchers to look at these unprocessed collections uh, if they feel like they can trust you. So be very professional when you're talking to them. Uh, and then there are some that will tell you, no, we don't let any researchers um, look at these. How I got this idea actually was I'm an avid reader and I listen to, I like to listen to authors talk about their writing process. Mm -hmm. And I've heard several authors talking about that they would go to this particular archives and do research for their book. And they got to look at records that are not available to the public yet. And I thought, well, if authors can do this, then why not genealogists? Mm -hmm. And I, like I always say, if you don't ask, you don't get. So the answer may be no, but you asked. And by asking, you've shown interest in that collection and it may move it up on the list for processing. Yeah, and you've also shown um, a knowledge of absolutely of records which is important as well i'm sure absolutely um, one of the things that happen here locally that um i also tell genealogists to do is we here look at our historical society found a collection of records at the atlanta national archives that had to do with tva flooding a certain part of our county for TVA uh, energy in 1943. And so TVA had donated all of their uh, glass plate negatives actually to the mm -hmm. National Archives in Atlanta. We found over 200 photographs that pertain to our county. So we contacted them, the Historical Society paid to get those done. And if you ever wanted to know about digitizing glass plate negatives, they're in deep freeze. You have to bring them out and let them come to room temperature before you can even digitize them. So a whole process there. Wow. But what we found out is the fact that we, we had to pay to get these photographs, which we understood that. But once they brought them out and all archivists usually do this and they digitize them for us, they then uploaded them to their website <laughs> for anybody to see and have for free. <laughs> So if you show an interest in a collection that is unprocessed or maybe not even digitized, you know, tell them, say, I would like to have copies. I like to pay for copies of this collection. But how about if you digitize it? And then once I get my digitized copy, put it on your website or put it out there for others to see. Right. You know, I know that you may be paying for that, but look what you're doing as a service for the genealogy community. Maybe actually it'll get out there into the public. That's that's actually yeah that's a really good good idea. I hadn't even thought about that whole process of the records and how that happens. Yes, um, it happens a lot more than people know. That once they've digitized it for you, they may go ahead and add it mm -hmm. to their website or to their Flickr account or whatever or wherever there's they're putting their records because they've already done the work. They don't want to do the work again. And right, so and it, it sounds like it's kind of a manpower, kind of a just mm -hmm. a monetary. The it issue is. is about mon it's it costs money to digitize these things. Absolutely. Um, whether it's you know money and and manpower, and that's a big deal. Yes, definitely. I could see that. I had no idea those things were in deep freeze. Wow. Yes, glade plus negatives they have to be stored in a deep freeze. Uh, and so when if you've ever if, if you ever find glass plate negatives in a finding aid or as part of a collection know that you're going to have to give the archivist time because they bring them out to deep freeze. They let them sit to bring them to room temperature and mm -hmm. then they digitize them. Hmm. And so they don't want to go through all that process again. So it's no wonder they uploaded them to their website. Right. Right. And I'm sure there's probably, it's not good for those things to be no, frozen and, and thawed multiple <laughs> times either. Absolutely. Um, Yikes. All right. Well, Melissa, you have, you have given, you've given me some really big thoughts to, to think about guys. If you have a question, go ahead and pop it in the comments. Um, and we'll make sure we get, we'll ask Melissa here in, in the next few minutes. Um, but this has been, this has been so helpful to me. It's given me some ideas to talk with. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk, 
mention too, especially because with Melissa being an archivist in, in the archives and museum now, so which I think is a great designation for you that you've got that, is that one of the tips I give people is to reach out to city, you know, museums, the local museums. It could be a very local, it could be, you know, I don't know, it could be, it could be anything. I mean, it could be, it could be a town or a city, or it could be on a very specific topic and reach out to, to the curator to see what they have, but then always ask who else should I talk to? Because they may not have what you need, mm -hmm. but mostly, I mean, it's a fairly, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, you know, the archivist community within an area is probably pretty small. They know yes. who, they probably know somebody you can talk with. Um, I actually tell people that regardless, you know, if you were doing an oral history interview with your own family members, you know, if you're talking to an archivist, if you're talking to, you know, a curator or museum, always ask who else should you talk with? Never leave that conversation because it's just a way of networking and finding out because you guys, I'm sure Melissa, you know, if I had a question, you know, it's like someone had a question about Williamson County and you're like, oh yeah, they have this, this, and this, and you know, yeah. you, know you know who to talk to and you know kind of things like that. So, and, yeah. and in a small place like where I live, we even know who and what individuals have what records <laughs> that we wish we had in our archives. <laughs> so, you know, but it, but it goes back to that question that I tell a genealogist to ask when they're researching in any area, where are the records? Mm -hmm. Now, people automatically think, well, well, the courthouse or this archive or the library, this, you know what, that's fine. They may be there. But instead of running around trying to figure out what, ask the question, where are the records? Mm -hmm. um, several years ago, I was looking for records for my husband's third great grandfather who had been shot and killed. Court records. Um, before this county had an archive in Tennessee, I went to the courthouse. I asked them. They looked at me like, well, I don't know. Well, come over here. They showed me this closet. And they opened the door and I mean, it was terrible. It was these books and records everywhere. And they said, here you go. It's probably in here somewhere. And they left me oh, to, just, to just rummage through. And so, you know, but I thought I found what I was looking for, though. I looked and I looked and I found what I was looking for. So you may find something like that. They may not be all organized and pretty and clean and ready for you to be researched. They may send you to a closet that says, here, this is what you're talking about. You know, and you're like, yeah. yes, thank you. <laughs> and if, you know, they may not have at that time, but then I'll, you know, go back, you know, call them again in a year or so. I know because uh, they may have processed something else by then when I was. Um, That's another good tip. Um, I tell genealogists is to when you're researching at a particular archive, whatever archive is it, it is, keep checking back often. Keep checking their websites, their social media pages, because a lot of those records that have been sitting on shelves, they may have processed or they may have received donations of records mm -hmm. since you've contacted them or talked to them. Constantly keep up with what they are doing. I mean, give drop them an email and say, "Have you got any new collections donated? Have you processed anything new?" Um, some of the archives that I follow actually send out have a mailing list, and they send out an email saying, "Here's some of our new collections we've collect we've processed." Mm -hmm. uh, and so, yeah, um, just because you didn't find anything on a certain day doesn't mean that a year later that they may not have what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Andrea has a question. Um, she said she has some glass negatives, but they've never been frozen. What should she do with them? I would say, I don't know where you live, but I would suggest that you would reach out to a local archive, if not a local archive, but especially the state archives. Um, any of those that you li live in the United States, I don't know if we have anyone uh, listening from out of the United States. Mm -hmm. All 50 U.S. states have a state archives. Mm -hmm. They all have a website. Uh, this is where you want to go for advice on records preservation, uh, the glass plate negatives. They all state archives have a conservator on staff. Now they cannot, most of them cannot do the work for you. They don't take work from personal uh, people, but they can give you some advice. Mm -hmm. And so I would contact one of them uh, at the state archives or maybe at a local university. They have conservators on staff there uh, and talk to them. Tell, let them know what you have. You may have something very historic to your area. And, you know, they may did want to see them. You may not want to donate them. I get that. But they, they may want to see them. They may want to get permission from you to digitize them because they are seeing it as a historical mm -hmm. uh, item. And then they'll give you that advice on how to store them. Right. And, and they know if, if, if it needs special handling, they know people in the area who Absolutely. actually provide those particular services too. Yes. I know about pre-COVID 
periodically our state archives would do, I just blanked on the name, but the time when you could sign up and bring in, say, an item and they would talk to you about the history, you know. Kind of like an antiques roadshow. A little bit, but it was kind of the conservative type thing, yeah, the yeah. conservator type thing and preserving it. So, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. You know, people should follow the state archives of where your ancestors lived. Like I said, my ancestors are West Virginia, um, uh, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland. And so I am on those state archives mailing list yeah. uh, and on those county archives mailing list. You know, I, I, I follow them, their, their websites, their social media mm -hmm. pages, because when they make an announcement of a find or some collection that they received or something, you know, I'll get notified of it or I'll know about it. And if it's something that pertains to my ancestors, I want to know. Yep. I'm the same way. Definitely. I don't mind getting those emails in my inbox. No, I do <laughs> not either. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much, guys, for joining us today. And thank you so much, Melissa, for coming on to chat and taking time out of your evening to talk with us about, I know, our favorite topic <laughs> of what's in the archives. So guys, we definitely want to encourage you guys to um, start getting a little creative with your searches and kind of expanding your thought processes on what you might find with um, those records. So yes, definitely. All right. So guys, Roots Tech starts tomorrow. Enjoy. Do not get overwhelmed. And my best piece of advice is to go ahead and create your plan. Take advantage of the live things because a lot of the pre-recorded sessions, you know, you have access to for a very long time over the next year. But things like the expo halls the, the, and then any live sessions do, you know, a, a lot of them will be pre-recorded, but, you know, it's, you won't get to talk to the vendors and things like that afterwards. So make sure can you I, take can advantage. Can I plug of mine? Time. Pardon? Can I plug mine? Oh, yeah. Plug. Oh, yeah. I should plug mine too. <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, I, have oh, a pre I have a pre-recorded <laughs> presentation on diaries, journals, and calendars documenting your ancestors' day-to-day -day life. And so look it up at Rich Tech. Um, it's a pre-recorded session, so you can access it at any time. But uh, if you watch it and want to make a comment or email me, my email is uh, melissabarker20 at hotmail.com. Yep. And my talk is on pulling social history or family history clues out of old family photographs. So, um, yeah, I'm super excited about that. In fact, I noticed that they still have mine from last year is still up. So I think they have, do. Yeah. So they actually still have some of the older, like last year's pre-recorded talks on the site as well. So um, definitely check that out. I am going to be live with Pongo tomorrow doing a, fire, a fireside chat. I think it's three o'clock Eastern time. So calculate your mountain time there. So yeah, so but you can just look up on on the site and you'll find it. So yes, yeah, so enjoy Roots Tech guys. I will be going live every day of Roots Tech. Tomorrow I will be here live at four. Uh, it has to be at four because I'll be doing live Roots Tech stuff at three. So at four o'clock, I'll be here just kind of talking about Roots Tech and you know what I'm seeing, what you don't want to miss and just kind of making sure we're, um, you know, getting the most we can out of Roots Tech. So until tomorrow. I'll talk to you later. Bye, guys. Bye.